And welcome everybody to the Planet Mullins podcast. I'm your host, Rob Mullins. And um, today I've got a fantastic guest with me who's uh, one of the local legends in Venice, California, uh, in the club scene, as a recording artist, as a music teacher, as a public figure, and as a uh, character. He's a very interesting <laughs> fellow. Yeah. Please join me in welcoming to the show Vinny Caggiano, eclectic guitarist. Hey, Vinny. Hi, Rob. It's great to finally meet you. I heard so much about you, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, before we uh, dive into this plethora of things that, that um, we're going to talk about today, I have to get my commercial in. So, BodyRejuvenationCandles.com is sponsoring the podcast today. Candles with a purpose to emit light and to moisturize and rejuvenate the skin as a lotion. Incredibly therapeutic for dry skin. And uh, I've used these for, you know, skin problems that I had in my hands and stuff. And they are amazing. It's a bit of a trippy concept because you have to melt this candle wax and then apply it to your skin. And then it, uh, mm. then you wash it off. And after repeated use, you'll notice like a great improvement. So That's a brilliant body concept. Rejuvenation, BodyRejuvenationCandles.com is sponsoring today. So, so Vinny, um, I got to ask you uh, yeah. a couple of, well, to start off, how did you get the title of eclectic guitarist? Because it's a play on words. And I noticed you're really fond of those like Vin Cognito. Mm -hmm. you know, and eclectic guitarists and stuff. So how did you come up with that nickname? Was it something you came up with or did the community give it to you over time or, or how? No, no, I, I, that's my branding. And basically I came up with it myself. Nobody gave it to me. The one, the, the name people gave me as a guitarist is a jazz guitarist, which is interesting to me. And we could talk about that later, but um, eclectic guitarist, basically it came out like I, I started building my website and back in 2003, which is now deprecated and I have to rebuild it. So, uh, it is what it is, but uh, um, basically I wanted some sort of branding and it just popped into my mind, you know, a pun on electric guitarist, but it's also, it's also a real world thing. Um, there, I am an eclectic guitarist, you know, and that comes uh, through like a really kind of winding road of history, you know. Well, I, I had, uh, in doing the show prep for today, I learned something about you that I hadn't known about, which was that you are really into African music. Oh and, yeah. And that you had joined some African bands. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about that. It's one side of you I don't know anything about. That's all part of the winding road. Um, uh, when I, I moved to Manhattan, I'm from New York originally, I'm brought up on Long Island, Long Island. And, I was starting to go into the city and I was meeting a lot of people there and I met this wonderful guy. So he's like a soul brother to me. His name is Gordy Ryan. He was w one of the lead drummers for, you might not know his name, but he's actually big in certain circles. His name is Baba Tunde Olatunji. Oh yeah, I know that name. And he was a master priest, uh, like a master kind of shaman as well as a drummer. An amazing character. I could tell you stories, man. Uh, Anyway, uh, through my, my buddy Gordy, he kind of, we started a band together, a straight, you know, cover band and everything. Uh, but then he got me to jam with Olatunji, and I began to dig more and more and more African music. You know, it's not harmonically interesting necessarily, but um, rhythmically it's, you know, very sophisticated stuff, uh -huh. you know. So I got into that. When I moved to L.A., it just like fell into my lap. I got involved with two African bands, Ayo Adayemi on one hand, who did like African high lifestyle. And uh, this guy, Sly Degbos, who was a keyboard player that was schooled at the uh, Conservatory of London. Wow. He knew his stuff. And it was a guitar player's dream. You know how we all love to turn up too loud and play for too long, right? <laughs> He, you know, one thing about Africans, they're not anal retentive. <laughs> they really aren't. You know? uh, this guy would like me. Yeah, we'd play over at the old St. Mark's, you know. Uh, okay. Venice, yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, he let me take 10 minute solos and stuff like this. So it was a guitar player's dream, you know. Wow. Well, yeah. you know, the, um, the way that the context that I met you in is um, we met through a mutual Venetian, Stan Barron's, the harmonica player. 
And Stan had told me about you. He says, you got to meet this local guy, Vinny, who's playing over at, uh, you know, Danny's Venice. And he's asked me to come sit in and do a few gigs with him. He's playing on Thursday nights over there. So I came in and checked you out. And um, what a great night that was. Yeah, yeah it, it was just, you know, amazing because you have like a presence and a vibe and, you know, this whole character and style about you. And you were playing with a um, some sort of a technical device that was providing all of these background chords and things. And then you were just shredding these ridiculous lead lines over over the top. I mean, what is that device that you use and how does that work? Yeah, that's a looper. Um, I have a dedicated looper. It's not a computer like laptop. It's, it's, it's a stomp box, basically. Okay. And of course it records, say, a chord progression, and then I get to jam out with myself. But it became an art form. Uh, for a while I was playing at a place called the Novel Cafe, and I was using digital effects along with it. Wow. Part of my history is actually classical. Even though I don't play classical guitar, I wanted to be a classical composer. Oh, wow. In my early days. Mm -hmm. um, so I love the idea of counterpoint and using different colors, you know. And I got to explore that with the looper and the digital effects. So I do all sorts of far out things. Like I had a 20 minute version of Ravel's Bolero, and I do with. Ravel did. I changed the colors every time it came around, and I'd make the colors a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger till finally at the end it was all out shred guitar, big, you know. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was a big hit actually when I played that one. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, with all these different kinds of music that you do, um, it was fun for me last year, possibly maybe it was the year before, to get the call from you to be the keyboard player on your latest album. Oh, yeah, Razzmatazz, yeah. And, uh, tell, tell everybody a little bit about your record. Yeah, my first record came out of digital looping, and that, that was, for all intents and purposes, that was a live record. It might as well have been, you know. There was only one song we did overdubs on, but the rest was all me just doing looping, because it has so many layers, it works, you know. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite record of the two I have out because it's really more artistic. It's more about showcasing my guitar playing. Razzmatazz was about my composing. I just, I had so many songs and, and I just wanted to get them out there in the world, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had already met and playing together and you so graciously came by and helped us out, played piano and you killed it. <laughs> and in fact, for the title, for the title song, Razzmatazz, I, I have to tell the story, man, and you know what story I'm going to tell. I laid down, I had laid down the lead sheet for you, and uh, you kind of, okay, and you start playing this rubato, going through my, the chord changes that I wrote, but doing your own, you never hadn't heard the song yet, you're just doing your own interpretation of the changes I did, and I went, my God, this is amazing. That take, unfortunately, we didn't capture that. But you know, I, you know, me and the producer George Monterey, I said, Rob, do the same thing you did before. We're going right, to use right, that as an intro, right. and it right. was so beautiful. I, you know, but I honestly think the best one, and this is like the nature of the studio. The best take was the one that wasn't the one. The original thing you did was amazing. The one on on the record is great. Right. No, no doubt about it. But the original impulse was like, wow, you know. Well, you know, I, I got to give a shout out to George and say, you know, there's a reason they call it the recording studio. So when the people come in, that's when you hit record. It's, right. not, <laughs> it's not later. Like I used to work at this studio called Wide Tracks and it was at Selma and Wilcox in Hollywood, really seedy area. And um Mike Hightower and Wayne Henderson from the Crusaders were the co-owners of that. And Wayne was always screaming at people, push the red, push the button, get the light on right now. He walked in, because see, we would have like Wawa Watson in there and we'd have Ray Fuller in there and we'd have Dwight Sills in there and we'd have Wilton Felder on bass and sack. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when these guys are just warming up and doing stuff, that's when all the ideas would come out. That's exactly it. It's always yeah, the people, first impulse that's the best, you know? Yeah. yeah, sometimes it's like that. But I, I noticed now that since uh, you and I have done a couple of projects, you were the featured guitarist on my Only in Venice documentary album. 
for example. And then uh, after we played at Danny's, we started playing at Sidewalk Cafe and we had a two person band and then we had a four person band and then we had a three person band and then, <laughs> then we had a two person band. <laughs> we had a two person band again. And, um, you know, it's, it's been real interesting to just watch you grow as a player and uh, a, a writer over the time that we know each other because you are really eclectic. You can play anything and you've got tons of chops, but you can also just phrase a ballad where it just makes you want to cry. You know, when you play um, Sleepwalk, for example, you know, I love your interpretation of that. And then you do this country kind of stuff on Sweet Sue. It's almost like, you know, Beverly Hillbillies vibe or yeah. something. Yeah, and, and not to forget, a uh, whole lot of love done rockabilly style. <laughs> That's with. right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, um, you know, since we started uh, playing together and stuff, one of the things that, that I've enjoyed so much about our time together is the breaks that we have in between sets because a lot of people, you know, that knew me before I met you and knew you before you met me were like, uh, these two guys are not going to get along. They're both so headstrong and they both are really opinionated and way off on the, you know, different spectrums and this and that. And what's been funny about it is that since I came in as a support uh, musician for you, I think that leveled the playing field in the beginning because I didn't come in as Rob Mullins Grammy nominated jazz piano player. I came in as the one armed drummer and <laughs> <laughs> playing the keyboard bass and you know a half of a drum set at the same time. But uh, the discussions that we've had about everything going on in the world have been amazing and yeah. um, you know, I was reading your uh, your epic interview with the Venice paparazzi, uh, which everyone should just go check out. Type in Vinny's name, and and uh, that big, huge feature article on him will show up. And one thing that that impressed me at, that is also common between us is that we don't like conflict, we don't like war, we don't like government interference in our lives and our affairs, and. I mean, how are you feeling about this current world situation? We got the virus going on, and then there was the looting, and there was the protests, and uh, the yeah. politics. Now there's going to be an election. Like, let's dive into some of that. Yeah. Uh, oh wait, some of the local color. You hear that? Right off Speedway. Now, okay, right off Speedway, people drive by and blast hip hop. You know. That's okay. That's Venice, man. Right. You know. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I'm almost afraid to touch on that subject of like what's going on because if I stated what I really felt about things, I'd be called the derogatory term a conspiracy theorist. And I consider myself like a bullshit detector more than a conspiracy theorist. Um, uh huh. Uh huh. You know, uh, you know the way things are today. If you if you say something like. I question what the mainstream media is saying about COVID-19, then you're immediately a Trump supporter, you're a neo-Nazi, you know, it's like crazy the way people just put you into a box. Uh, I, yeah. You know, obviously I don't fit into that box. I'm more liberal than I am conservative. For, yeah, for I've, sure. always thought of, I've always thought of you as being more liberal, but what's been interesting about our relationship that I think would be just something I should point out to my viewers and to your fans that are watching is that we have really different opinions about certain things but mm -hmm. when we are talking about them we're not being judgy like yeah. you know you would say you could say something to me like well somebody thinks i'm a conspiracy theorist and i'd say okay well why and then you would explain it to me and i would say okay well let me think about that let's go play the next set i'm this not how gonna, things should happen i mean because you you know it, the rush to judgment is the biggest problem I see. I mean, I have a, a friend of mine who um, this was about four months ago of you know Facebook friend, and uh, this was when Trump had said something about uh, drink bleach or something. Right. That, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and so on one hand, you know, I talked to my drummer Liam about that, and he said. That was the funniest joke I heard all day. Like, is obviously Trump was joking, but 
this other friend of mine went on Facebook to defend what Trump said without even watching the video. And man, her phone lit up, like her family was kicking her out of the family. And then yeah. um, she was gonna be kicked out of the church. And then mm -hmm. the, her boss at her main gig called up and said, well, this is horrendous. And you can't, now people are unfriending her like, <laughs> and why? Like the touchiness, it's like everybody's on their last nerve being judgmental towards others. And that is just, that just sucks, man. You know, it's ironic you, you say that because I, I just posted on Facebook saying I, um, that to have a knee-jerk reaction, I, well, I won't even say knee-jerk reaction. When you, when a person reacts immediately with outrage, anger, judgment, right? That's a much, much easier path to take than being compassionate, understanding, and loving. Listening. Yeah, you know? Mm -hmm. It takes effort to be that way, to, to like accept and allow, you know? Right. And I got into a thing with my own cousin who I love dearly, and she is such a radical liberal. Like, you know, she was posting things on Facebook like Trump should die and all this kind of thing. And I, 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 I don't trust any politician, I, not a single one of them, not, right. since, not since Kennedy, <laughs> right? So, yeah, sure. You know, well, I don't trust I, them. The you know what i what i try and explain to people about my own view is that you've got this whole wide spectrum of all of these different views but ultimately all of the government <clears throat> excuse me all the government is corrupt like it's, yeah. not, it's not like the republicans are blameless and they're wonderful the democrats are blameless and they're wonderful like there's you know skeletons and uh the swamp and all that on both oh, sides it's just you know and the standard the, here's the funny man is that when people want to uphold other people to a certain standard that it, you know and i grew up in the baptist church i mean we were about as mm. bumped as you could be but it was judge not lest ye be judged and he who is without sin cast the first stone and why do people expect every person to be exactly perfect all the time? Like, none of us are. And, and, you know, like you said, there's no acceptance of a gradient of a personality or... Have you heard of uh, Daryl Davis, the key, the piano player? Have you heard about that? No, guy? I don't know, Daryl. Dude, what a story. And, and I learned so much from him. What an incredible human being. This guy was working in the Deep South as a kind of... Uh, wasn't a jazz guy. He was more like uh, in the style of Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, okay. that kind of thing, right? Like kind of rock and roll piano, but he was good. Mm -hmm. And he's playing in this bar and this white guy comes up to him and says, hey man, let me buy you a beer. You're just such a great player. He goes, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis invented this style. <laughs> and Daryl says to him, well, no, not exactly. <laughs> you know, And starts talking about black musicians and stuff. Then they start budding up, right? So his, the white guy's friend comes over, another white guy, and says, show him your card. He was a card-carrying KKK member, okay? Wow. And Daryl, you know, he's one of these guys who has the ability not to knee-jerk react, right? Uh -huh. So he just kept charming this guy. They wound up being great friends. He wound up quitting the KKK, and then, as if that wasn't enough, Daryl made it his mission to go out of the way to meet KKK people, get to know them. And he's, he's like, I don't know how many KKK guys he's already, you know, uh, they quit because they realize. So that told me the only reason there's bigotry is fear. These people are, are afraid of black right. culture. Yeah, well, right. And fear is how the, um, you know, everything is presented to us in the media. Mm -hmm. It's like, you're not allowed to go out of your house. Oh, yeah. You know, you're not allowed to uh, watch these kinds of TV shows. You can only watch this sort of thing. And you're not mm -hmm. allowed to think for yourself. And you're not allowed yeah. this, you're not allowed mm -hmm. that. And, you know, the restrictive thing based on fear is what I think gets a lot of people really agitated so that when they're on Facebook, they're just so ready to just go off, you know, the slightest little thing, like you can say, good morning, and there's 50 people that go, it is not good. It is absolutely a terrible day. I hate you. Mornings are bad. 
then you're just like, whoa, man, just please, you know, mm -hmm. everybody calm the F down, you know, and, and um, how interesting that your friend took the time to hear the other guy's viewpoint. Oh, he's like, not a friend of mine. He's like a media personality at this point. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, yeah but it's just, I, I mean, that's just so great because yeah. when, when you need jerk react and, and I, uh, and I want to get into your guitar teaching too, because you're like the God of uh, California uh, guitar lessons and stuff. But I've done a lot of workshops with young people where I'll go to like a middle school or a high school or a college and I'll say, okay, you tell me what's your favorite kind of music. And they'll say, I like uh, Madonna. And I'll say, what kind of music do you hate? And they'll say, jazz. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. And then I say, well, why don't you try giving jazz a chance? Or if you're a classical person, why don't you try giving reggae a chance? And why don't you study it when it's trying to get an entire, like a whole picture about it? Because I hated country music, for example, when, and my dad listened to country and he hated jazz. Right. And, you know, he would be playing this country stuff and I'd just be going, man, is Johnny Cash ever going to get off that low E string? Is he ever going to get off and that yeah. low E string? I'm so sick of it. And then over decades of time, I became a fan of country music because I realized, duh, it's about the stories. Like, you know. Right, exactly. It's not about the music necessarily. It's no, more about, it's, not, yeah, it's yeah. not about the, you know, E13 plus 11 chord going to A7 flat nine. But, you know, you um, have a pretty good uh, uh, thriving teaching business there. I guess you're doing it all online now, but uh, yeah, how, did you yeah. come, how did you become interested in teaching and become a music teacher? Yeah, well, a long time ago, I figured out that I'm not going to make a lot of money from performance, you know. You know, like, like you know, you know, as a musician, either you make it or you don't. Either you're rich or you're poor, you know, it's, that's just the way it is. You're not going to, um, yeah, well, that's just the way it is. So uh, I decided early on, I started teaching when I was 21. Mm -hmm. And the, one of my very first students was about 16, 17, and he'd already been arrested for breaking an entry and just causing, causing havoc, right? Uh -huh. I started teaching him Led Zeppelin and, and, uh, stuff from uh, rock uh, what was it rocky horror show that thing and <laughs> right uh i just started teaching him the things he would love to learn mm. about three months later his mom uh, see this is why i kept teaching too it's more than just making money for me um the mom calls me up three months later and she goes vinnie i have to thank you and i said for what and she goes ever since he started learning guitar he just hangs out with his friends in the basement and they they play all day and they have a great time and he's not doing anything, you know, that gets him into trouble. So. All right, the second degree murders and the burglary stopped after four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he went that far. He might have, you know, but. <laughs> oh but you know what I say? Um, what we say about country music? Yeah. This, this is, goes back to the eclectic guitar thing. I've done country sessions. I've done jazz sessions. I've done funk sessions. I've done, you name it. I've 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 done thousands of hours in the studio for people. Uh, even African, you know, and uh, look, the universal scale is a pentatonic scale. So I don't get when a country guitar says, oh, I only play country guitar or a jazz guitar says, oh, I only play jazz guitar. It's like, well, wait a second. It's the same freaking scale. It's just <laughs> the way you intonate the scale. That's slightly different. Right. Now, me, I'm lucky. I'm, I'm like this weird musical chameleon. Like all I need is a... Um, a little bit of exposure to a kind of music and without technically sitting down and learning, I, I could fake it. Like I was doing a lot of um, what I call fake gypsy jazz for a long time. That was the thing I was doing because I, I got it. I understood it when I heard Django and I heard the contemporary gypsy guy, I heard it, you know, right. I said, Oh, I could fake this, you know, harmonic minor scale. They love minor keys, minor six chords. Okay. I'll do that. You know, so. This is you know, this well, is why I don't get like people just specialize. You could if you could play one form, you play another. It's you know what it's like. It's like uh, can I understand the English language if I'm a New Yorker and and somebody's from the South? You damn well bet I can. 
you know, somebody's from the South, so they have a draw. If I learn that draw, then I'm really kind of locked in. Well, it's easy to fake the draw. It's, that's the same way with music. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting because um, we're close to the same age, and I grew up with uh, a lot of television shows that were pretty crazy, and one of them was Hee Haw. And that, <laughs> show, Hee Haw, yeah. that show had the mostly country music, but they had like Buck Owens was on there, and uh, I think Mel Tillis and Merle Haggard. And I was watching one of these guys one day with, you know, this silly straw hat on and the suspenders and this and that sitting on, on that set that they had designed to look like a farm. And he was just playing the, the bejesus out of this banjo at a hundred million miles an hour. Yeah, right, right. And all you would have to do was just, you know, put a ride symbol to that playing the jazz beat and it's jazz. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you change the bass right. and to make mm -hmm. it a walking 4-4 instead of a two beat, mm -hmm. it's jazz. And if you do it in halftime over a drum machine, it's hip hop. And see, exactly. the things that guys like us really know. And what's funny with me and my teaching world, because I, I teach any kind of music people want to learn. And, you know, sometimes these kids will come in and they got the big giant freaking purple hair and they got some bolt through their nose and they've got, you know, tattoos going on in this. You know what they're looking for. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, and, you know, I, I say, what do you want to learn? Because we're similar in that way too, as teachers, the first thing to do, establish common ground with your student on the music that they love, because they're going to mm -hmm. want to learn to play. Mm -hmm. them. You know, yeah. you can't use that approach of, well, we're going to do Cherney and we're going to do Hannon and, everybody's you know right. is 250 years old and been dead right. for, no so but then i would reach them through that and then over time try and convey that the lifestyle is not necessarily important to be a good musician because mm -hmm. those guys i mean like glenn campbell okay let's take glenn campbell he's one of my all-time favorite uh, country slash pop guys. That guy was a killer jazz guitar player. Like, oh, yeah. Ridiculous. And he was in, you know, almost like a double identity. Like he would be doing all of these recording sessions, playing this amazing jazz stuff. And then he would go record Wichita Lineman. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, that's two completely different mm -hmm, separate careers. Mm -hmm. And it was many, many years later, I found out Glenn was you know, deep into the session world and playing all of these uh, amazing jazz riffs and stuff. And even um, Liberace is another example. He had this stick with the, uh, you know, uh, the candles on the piano and all the jewelry and the Vegas. That guy was a great jazz player. Yeah, I bet. But, yeah. But, you know, he didn't try and make money playing jazz, which is, I think, where I went wrong with my life. <laughs> <laughs> well you know one thing i love about playing with you rob is you do have that and you have to look at it like from the point of view as you and i grew up with the british invasion psychedelic music and then the 70s disco and all all these changes at punk rock all this stuff that was happening reggae right. was big in the 70s right um and like if you take a jazz musician from the 40s it's just pure jazz you know they take the pop songs of the time, but they were written by composers that knew their theory, you know. Right. Um, but then you get this rock and roll thing that happens and it gets sophisticated. You know, you get to the Beatles and stuff like that. Or even The Doors, one of your uh, favorite bands, right? You take a song like Touch Me, the modulations in that are insane. insane. This is great writing. This yeah, is really the, writing, the writing is incredible. And, you know, I remember having two albums that I got when I was about nine or ten years old and the first one i got was the doors debut album mm -hmm. and the second one i got was buddy rich big band mm -hmm. called big swing face yeah so i mean i loved this as i started on drums i was like man the buddy rich thing with all his horns and it's so sophisticated and everything and then you know on the other side of it i'm going to my mom in the kitchen when she's cleaning up after dinner and going mommy what does a backdoor man do 
Ed. <laughs> That's one of those, I'll tell you later, son. Yeah. <laughs> she was like, go ask your father. <laughs> but when you, when you take all of the various sides of, of different genres of music, and I want to go back to the Beatles and talk about them because I know you love them and I do, it's the open-mindedness of a person that I think is critical. That's, I'm more attracted just in general, friend-wise, romantically, uh, business-wise. The more open-minded people are, the more I'm interested in them. Because when open-minded people think about history, they go, okay, well, here's this version of history. And then here's other events that tie into that history. Then let me devil's advocate all of the history and look at it from a perspective of a group or look at it from a perspective of the media trying to write mm -hmm. that history to control something or whatever. Right, right. And then you end up, and my dad taught me this, he says, be circumspect. Look at all the sides of the issue before you judge anything. You're right, right. And mm -hmm. that's, what's, that's what's really got me freaked out about what's happening in our in our world now with the people just this teeny little bit of uh, reality and then this giant meltdown happening and you know as things started to get weirder this year I've had more and more people calling me up saying well Rob you always know what to do what do I do and, and I'm <laughs> well, like I don't know yeah. why, I, why am I supposed to know man I don't have a freaking clue I think we're all going to hell in a handbasket and, um, you know, you, you've many times said, hey, if it all ends uh, today, then cool, you know, because I kind great. of wish it would, uh, you know, it's kind of like a sick dog. You just want to put it out of its misery, you know, if it's on its last legs, you just want to euthanize the thing. I mean, humanity is suffering hard right now. Yeah. Which that's the one thing that that kind of holds back my. I mean, I am judgmental about the state of humanity. I admit it. I'm pissed off at the world and the way people are reacting to things. I admit it, you know. But that is the one thing that kind of opens a little bit of door, you know, mm -hmm. for compassion and understanding because these people are afraid. They're scared shit. They don't know what to do. Right. You know? Right. Well, being scared is uh, is a really common thing that's going on. And um I get that way from time to time. Most of the time I'm pretty calm and I'm pretty level because I've put out my albums. I've had my brilliant career uh, in, in jazz. I've made a name for myself. I played with a bunch of big time artists and all of that's secure. And it's been really fun. I mean, I've had a long ride. It's been great and it's still continuing uh, to go, but somehow we're going to have to come out on the other side of this thing. And I don't think anybody has the answer because I have people calling up and they'll like rant and rail on the liberal side for 20 minutes. And they will say, what do you think, Rob? And I'll say, nobody knows about this virus. You know, you turn on this station and they say stat, 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 stat recommendation. And I go, okay, but they don't know. Okay. Now turn on the other station. Now listen to them, stat, 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 recommendation. They don't know. Yeah. Nobody freaking knows, man. I mean, let's just get it out there. Like, nobody knows what's going to happen. You can think a lot of different ways, but fighting amongst ourselves is the worst possible thing you can do. A hundred percent. You know, you get, you get all these little frac fractional groups just going nuts uh, against each other and nothing positive gets done. So... Anyway, I want to go back to the Beatles because um, when I was a really little kid, I saw them come on the Ed Sullivan show. Mm, and I'll I never remember. forget because we had one of those TVs that had the three channels, you know. Right, right. Yeah, there was no remote control TV. NBC, ABC, CBS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got the little rabbit ears up there on the oh, top. Oh, yeah, I remember it all. Yeah. I remember in Ontario, California, um, you know, with Ed Sullivan show and Ed comes out and I just could never take Ed seriously anyway, because he was like two feet high and had this whole weird, the, the really big shoe, you know. <laughs> but he put the Beatles on, and I have two older sisters. And man, when the Beatles came on TV, they just went nuts. I mean, I got, 
I mean, they got, uh, one of my sisters was seven years older and the other was five years older. It was just like, boom. I mean, yeah. they were in love immediately. And then of course, the whole country fell in love with the Beatles. Then the world fell in love with the Beatles. Well, what was it or is it that's, you know, all these 50 some years later about the Beatles that makes them so huge? Yeah, that well, that's uh, kind of a mystery. I mean, I, the Beatles, to me, the Beatles weren't just a musical pop group. They were a cultural phenomenon. And the likes of which I don't think we'll ever see again. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing, you know, there were, people came along and broke their records, like Michael Jackson broke their, I don't know, record. You know, oh, people come along and, oh, well, you know, the Beatles did this. Well, Michael Jackson did this. Okay, fine. You know, but there's one thing the Beatles did that no art, other artists in the past, and I don't imagine in the future, will ever do. And that is, because of the cultural changes that were going on, they were like a mirror for the culture. You know, it was kind of this back and forth thing that was going on between them and the culture, them and the culture. Um, they turned the entire planet on to love. That was their message. Wow. And it wasn't just like, you know, cheesy, sentimental kind of love. It was like divine love. You can go back to Rubber Soul and the song The Word. That was the first time I realized, well, this isn't a love song. This is about universal love here. Uh huh. You know? Uh, so that's when I started thinking about the Beatles differently, even as a kid, you know? But I'll tell you this. I started some years ago. I'm a theory nerd, you know that, and yeah, music theory. Yeah, I discovered that there are three systems through which to, to analyze and view music, not just the one we were taught, major minor key system. Um, I'll give you an example. Like if you're I, thinking, in, if I taught one of my students the modes, right, and then there's a situation where E7 resolves to A minor in the key of C, right? right. They'll go to me. Is that the Aeolian mode? And then I, I realize we're shifting now into the major minor key system. It's right. no longer the modes, right? Right. So I realized that to analyze music, you need different lenses. So the three categories I came up with was the Greek modes, the major minor key system, and oddly enough, and this isn't recognized in academia, blues. Blues broke so many rules. The dominant seven as a chord you could relax on for the first time this happens. Right. Right, because it was always known as the five chord. Going somewhere. Going to the right? one. Yeah. Going to one or wherever it, you know, temporarily goes to. But uh, in the blue, not only that, but really, really huge minor pentatonic scale against what's ostensibly a major chord, minor against major, right? Right. This is huge. This affected the, the world. People do this all around the world now. And academia doesn't even look at this and analyze it and say, well, what are the principles here? Why is this working? Uh -huh. So I started writing a book about all this. And what I wow. did was I, I started analyzing the music of the 60s. And then I realized something. You know, jazz has been elevated to this high, sophisticated form. You know, nothing but respect. Most jazz musicians will think, well, this is the highest form right now we mm -hmm. have in the West. You know, this is uh, one jazz guy, I forget who said it, it's, it's the classical music of America. Right. Right. But then I, I started analyzing chord progressions of like, say, um, it's kind of a dorky song, but up, up and away in my beautiful balloon, that song or Monday, Monday. Right. Monday, Monday is insane. It's brilliant. And so is uh, up, up and away. The modulations all over the place, these winding, sinuous modulations. It blew me away to see that these composers were doing this. And yeah, maybe they weren't doing, you know, 13 flat nine chords, you know, maybe they were just doing triads even. Right. But the brilliance of the chord movement. So I, you know, I made it my mission. Why is this music elevated to the status of jazz? Yeah, not, it's not an improvisational form, but it's a compositional form that sure. deserves. And that's why the Beatles were so great because I could go back to early Beatles and watch these moves that they would make with the chord movement go, early Beatles. And I go, this is really sophisticated. This isn't, this isn't just some teenagers that don't know anything, you know, right. they're really searching for sounds and they didn't know any theory. Right. Well, the, you know, being on the cusp of a certain era uh, is something I think they were lucky uh, yeah, they were in lucky. certain ways because American music was coming over and influencing them. I, I got a, just a quick story. Um, 
because coming from a really religious conservative family, uh, when John Lennon made his comment that could have been, re in, uh, you know, could have been interpreted a lot of ways that the Beatles are now more popular than God. Right. Or was it Beatles more Jesus. popular than Jesus? Yeah. So when my mom heard that, she took Hard Day's Night and uh -oh. Rubber Soul uh -oh. and she turned the oven up to 450. Oh, no. <laughs> And she put those albums in the oven like a pizza. And that was the end yeah. of, of those two albums. I mean, she melted them because that made her so angry. And, yeah. and, you know, the Beatles didn't push a religious agenda, but the universal love carried through everything that they recorded. I, I mean, yeah. all those albums. And I'd have, do you have a favorite album? Because mine is Rubber Soul. I mean, Rubber that's... Soul is awesome, man. It really is a beautiful record. It really is. I have a book called uh, The Enduring Beauty of Rubber Soul, you know. Oh, wow. I'm such a Beatles nerd, man. I, I, you know, on my YouTube channel, I have a whole series analyzing Beatles music and breaking down the chord changes and what's going on. Oh, uh, wow. You know. Uh, what's the, tell everybody the name of your YouTube channel. Oh, it's uh, uh, youtube.com forward slash vincognito, like incognito with a B. Um, maybe you can put it in the show notes. I'll give you the link. Okay. You know. um, yeah, uh, and I have a whole series. The book I was writing called Fragments of Infinity, all about the three systems and music theory and my perspective on theory, which is not, you know, over and over again, I'll teach something to my students. That they'll never teach you this in music school. You'll never get this in music school. My ideas, you know. Right. Um, well, did you develop this stuff from going to music school or you just kind of came up with it all on your own over time? Well, I, I went to jazz school and I went as a composer. You know, I wanted okay. to be a composer. Uh, so I wasn't studying guitar, I was studying piano. And uh, I, was, I, I was voracious for the theory. That's what I really wanted to learn. So this stuff kind of stayed with me for years and years and years. And what happened was I was, theory is hard for people. You know this. People have a really hard time with it. Right. Uh, you know, they really do. And uh, I realized this over time. So I'm thinking, like, what are ways I can explain this so they'll understand, you know? Right. You have to come up with different ways. So what happens is I came up with all these maps. And then when I made the maps, I realized, oh, wait a second, what's going on over here? This isn't, you know, this isn't according to what I was taught in school. Uh, know, well, I'll give you an example. Okay. I, I, you probably do this. Like, I talk about through scales. You can either improvise per chord, right? Like I'm going to play this scale on this chord, this scale on this chord, this scale on this chord, which to me was an exhausting concept when I was in jazz school. So right. when I call decided, it vertical, vertical improvisation, according to George. Thank Robert, you. Yeah, vertical. Uh, yeah. Well, he was quite. Each chord has a scale. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wish, I wish I, you're so fortunate to have worked with him, man. Um, well, yeah, I mean, that was a, we could do an hour on that, but, but go ahead with your thought. Um, then you said about the blue scale, would you be superimposing that over the whole series of chords then? Uh, I was going to say, well, that's one example of what I call a through scale, right? So if I have an E7 going to an A minor, as soon as I'm on an E7, I'm going to be playing the A harmonic minor scale. So when I look at, at jazz charts, I would, I would look at rows of chords and say, do these all fit into one situation? Like from right. the same scale, you know, the same scale, do these chords all derive from, and then I would just use that scale. That was my way of getting through jazz because I didn't have the patience to think, I'm in this chord now, I'm in this chord now. It's just like, ah, you know. You know, George calls that um, horizontal improvisation where mm -hmm. you're using the resolving tendency of two or more chords. Mm -hmm. And so he somehow brilliantly, all the way back in the late 40s, just figured out there's these two concepts that are basically mm -hmm. how everybody navigates through harmony. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, uh, am fond of doing this one thing with my students when they get a little too uppity and they'll come in and they'll say, okay, I've learned everything about John Coltrane's giant steps and I'm now going to play my butt off. So the fee dee 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 <laughs> I say, okay, now do all that over this route. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Well, nobody was expecting that. 
yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You know, harmony, and this is, you know, I love that you're writing and doing these. What's the title of your book again? It's just amazing. It's so popular. Uh, Fragments of Infinity, but the book is defunct. I mean, it's just sitting on a computer. I'm not going to. No, but it. I mean, it's just the title is so cool. I want one. <laughs> Fragments of Infinity, but um, I started rewriting the Circle of Keys in the last six months because I've had mm -hmm. you know, time on my hands, and I put the root or the tonic at the bottom. You know how you get Circle of Keys off the internet? It always says C at the top. Mm -hmm. I, well, in what universe is the root of something at the top? Mm -hmm. it doesn't work on the planet Earth. Mm -hmm. You don't look at a tree and you go, hey, there's the roots up there in the air. <laughs> Mark. <laughs> right, right, right. No, it's a, it's a foundation. Like you've got mm -hmm. that and then you have the various branches that come out. That's your 12 tone system. Mm -hmm. And then frequency wise, it's the same kind of thing. The lower tones are uh, you know the grounded ones, the, mm -hmm. the notes, and then you've got the harmonic stuff in the middle, and then you've got your singers and your trumpet players and your piccolos. That's mm -hmm. what's actually all up at the top. And you wouldn't believe how much guff I'm getting from some of these theory people that see my circle of keys and they're like, well, that's all upside down and backwards. And I said, according to who? According to who? Yeah, I mean, you, because once you're out of school, and you're facing the challenges that all all musicians face is how am I going to eat and uh, take care of myself and do my art and my craft and make all of this work? Right. Uh, you know, then you're really free to just explore things. And I, I mean, I remember being on gigs with you sometimes where you would just launch into some solo on some D minor thing or vamping. And you're in another world, man. I didn't even know what the hell it was. And I'm just playing along and going, man, this is great. You know, he's, uh, he's on another universe. Uh, and then you would bring it back in. But that isn't that concept of, you know, the tension and the release, a big part of your sound. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one thing I, I started getting into, like if you're in a, a melodic minor situation, especially, is like on the five chord, or you could play a whole stone scale, no problem, you know. Right. But I started doing it on the one chord, you know, for example. And to me, like improvising on a guitar is like playing a video game. I'm shooting for this particular note, and I'm going to do this run, and I somehow have to get there. Thank God for chromatic notes, because I do get that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay. um, but yeah, I have this one thing where I, I'll, I'll do a... a, a say against an E minor chord, I'll start on a, an A minor chord, I'll start on a G sharp and do a descending uh, whole tone scale. And I'll try to wind up on the lower G sharp an octave below and then resolve it when the A minor comes in. Uh, uh, I, I mean, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I'm on the A minor already, so, but I'll, right. I'll go down to that G sharp and then bring it in and it creates so much tension that when you get there, it's like, ah, you know. Right. Well, that's a superimposing, you know, a chord progression over a target foundational or root tone. Mm -hmm. And that's what is so great about a lot of uh, music that's out there. I mean, Beatles, Hendrix, uh, Doors, you know, and anybody that's using pedal tones uh, in terms of you know, of a, a note that plays constantly mm -hmm. underneath it, because we've done that in our, our band, The Elegant Strangers, where I've just got like an E going down there, rumbling, and you're playing all 12 major chords for a mm -hmm. while, mm -hmm. and all kinds of different configurations, and the audience is just going, oh my God, these crazy beat people, they don't <laughs> know where they are, and then you land on the E, finally at the end of the, <clears throat> and it's like, oh, yeah, that was genius, you know. I made a recent discovery, and this is why chromaticism works, you know. Okay. I made a recent discovery, and it especially works in minor keys, but um, you know the tritone interval, right? So you have a G7 chord, you have an F and a B inside the G7 chord. Right. When you have half steps next to each other, the half step is drawn to the other one. So B is drawn to C, and F is drawn to E. So if you have right. an upper one, it's drawn to the lower. If you have a lower one, it's drawn to the upper. Right. So if you do a chromatic, like even with an entire chord, bunch of 
dominant seven chord just going chromatically, they'll eventually resolve because it's attracted to the next half step lower, the next half step lower, the next half step lower, and boom, you get there, you know? And the other thing that's cool about that is that if you um, make those chromatic notes move, but you use the roots on the circle of keys, it goes through all 12 around the circle of keys and ends up at the starting point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, by now we've alienated 90% of the <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? This is the most we've ever talked about music theory together. You know, we, we never really got yeah. deep into it. I've always wanted to. Yeah, I, I have too. I mean, I, um, I just like the fact that there are, you know, big frameworks out there by geniuses that came before us that we could, you know, use as our mm -hmm. developmental ideas for teaching music lessons and helping people understand. Because your point you made earlier about having different approaches for the same idea, you know, man, that's been so valuable for me to think like that with students because some students are gonna come in and they're naturally wired to be more creative and more loosey-goosey and not so technical. Right. And other students will come in and it'll just be like, there is not one shred of emotion coming out of their heart in mm -hmm. any direction and all they are is math and numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so trying to find you know, ways to reach all of the different personality types out there, I think is really an art as a teacher. And I, I've talked to some of your students and they're all pissed off. No. They're, <laughs> they're, you're, as well they should be. <laughs> as well they should be. Well, um, we're, we're getting to the, uh, about the end of the hour here, Vinny. So I can't thank you enough for coming on my show. And um, I hope we get a chance to play more and talk more in the future. I mean, you're a, a Venice celebrity and um, you're all, you'll always be a famous guy in my book. And, and you know, the, I, I love the heck out of you and playing with you. And uh, if you have any advice for the, for the people out there uh, about anything, you know, world-wise or musically or anything you want to say to wrap up. Wow. Uh, wow. That's a huge question. Um, well, I'll go, I'll go work with a body rejuvenation candle for a while and come back and give you time to think about it. By the way, that's a great concept they have there with those candles. These things really work, man. Yeah. I, have, and I have one right here, but it's really hard to, because of the uh, way that the screen works, it's really hard. Oh, to I see. Them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It, you know, it disappears. <laughs> disappears in there but there we oh, go there it is yeah yeah there i can see it now but it's real close yeah but uh yeah i i swear by these things i mean they're really good they come in different flavors and all that but um you know no pressure on on that big of a question well one thing i would say is this i mean regarding when you brought up the state of the world one thing i would say is this remember I would say to people, like in terms of judgmentalism and how crazy people are, people are crazy right now, let's face it. Um, I would say this, remember that it's easy. It's easy to jump into a judgment, to get pissed off, to be outraged. It's much, much harder and it takes effort to, to try to comprehend where that person is coming from. Mm -hmm. I think you and I, I think musicians that are truly immersed in music understand this. I think we understand it naturally being musicians. Uh -huh. uh, you know, I, I found that really, truly immersed musicians think in a different way than most people do. Right. You know, because why we're trained to listen. And that's the key thing, you know, wow. that's no that's, pun intended. Well, that's really, yeah, I, I get it. Um, I think that's a great way to wrap up because mm -hmm. the, you know, for years and years and years, I remember my mom telling me that saying, you know, the key to keeping everything going is people have to listen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, uh, and part of the reason people have trouble now is that we're in this hurry up digital universe and listening takes time. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot more time than punching <clears throat> someone. And then, you know, listening and thinking about things and trying to meet people somewhere, you know, halfway mm -hmm. um, in, in things instead of just, you know, that rush to, okay, now I finally have something to be really mad at. And I'm going to go on Facebook and type for eight hours of all this hate and all this vitriol. And man, I, you probably see it too. Uh, about once a week, I post on my Facebook, I've just been offline 
for six hours and it was awesome. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> I started doing that. I used to be addicted to Facebook and I'm taking these long breaks away from it. Yeah, it's really great. It's just well, a stoop out of negativity too. Yeah, I know. Well, anyway, so um, okay, folks, he's got a couple albums out. He's featured on my project called Only in Venice at onlyinvenice.com. He's got uh, what's the Loop album the title of that? It's called Loop Du Jour. I think you can find it on uh, iTunes. Uh, Loop Du Jour and then uh, Razzmatazz. Razzmatazz, where you're featured on that record, so right. especially the and, title song. And then your YouTube channel is youtube.com slash Cognito. Yes. And yes, of course, indeed. Vinny's on Facebook, too. And it, if you don't know um, uh, Vinny or... You know, you haven't seen him on Facebook. He has a knack for finding the wackiest, most hilarious stuff of anybody that I know. Like anytime I log on and I see something from him, it's always just got this sense of humor and this kind of. You know why nobody could argue or get mad at something that makes them laugh? You know, that's why I do it. It's like, okay, I'm not going to take a side, but I'll post this really funny image of a, you know. Well, you posted one recently that was about numbers. And yeah. uh, mm. that, and it was like, uh, what were they? It was like three numbers. It was like, oh, it's like uh, the scariest number. I'm 1984. I'm the scariest <laughs> number. And then, and then you, Y2K comes and says, I'm 2000. I'm the scariest number. And then, there, then 2020 comes and it says, ha 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 ha. Hold my beer. <laughs> Hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, my friend. I'll see you uh, around the boardwalk or Hope to see over, you soon. At, uh, over yeah, at Groundwork sometime soon, bro. Have a good All night. All right, take okay. care. It was a lot of fun, dude. You too. Bye.